All right, so today we're gonna to be talking about range of motion assessment of the foot and ankle. There's a couple different ways that we can go about this. The first is we can look at it functionally, and that would be through observational assessment. Uh, it can be done in a standing position, a weight-bearing position, as well as half kneeling, and also with some different functional tasks. Things like squatting, single leg stance and balance, stair ambulation and just gait can all give us a, an impression as far as what the individual has functionally at the foot and ankle. Additionally, we can look at gross range of motion, just actively, what the individual has as they move through some different postures and positions. And then finally, uh, we can actually use an objective measurement with a goniometer to put some uh, objective quantifiable data to what the individual has, and then that allows us to track that data. Uh, it's a great way to substantiate the interventions and the treatments that we're choosing and a way to prove that the indi individual is receiving skilled care that is benefiting them as they're making improvements in these objective areas that weren't being measured and tracked. So, as we begin to take a goniometric assessment, I prefer to start the individual in a prone position. Some clinicians will have them start in a supine position. Um, I find that prone works just a little bit better because I can get more of my uh, range of motion assessments uh, without having the individual flip too many times, right? And so we'll talk about those in just a moment. Uh, as you're in this position as well, if you need to uh, complete any additional observational assessments, it's a great time to do that. And so, uh, if you're, if you're kind of trying to sequence your exam, moving from observation into range of motion is a nice way to do that. So the first thing that we're gonna start with is we're gonna think of our setup. And as you can see right here at kind of the, the foot and ankle where the, the treatment table is currently hitting our, our uh, uh, patient, it's not conducive to getting full ankle dorsiflexion. So the first thing we need to do is we need to ask our patient to slide down on the table towards us. That gives us enough clearance to where now when they dorsiflex, they're not gonna hit their foot against the table. You can also take a bolster, uh, a foam roll, a pillow, towel, something and slide underneath to where you would lift up the foot and ankle just a little bit. Uh, that would also provide some clearance. But what you need to be careful of is you've now taken out a two joint muscle from the equation. Keep in mind that the calf muscle complex, triceps sura, crosses two joints. So as soon as we uh, take the foot and ankle up and we unlock the knee from an extended position, we're now changing the length tension relationship and that can alter our range of motion measurements. Whatever we do, we need to make sure that it's standardized, that we're doing it the same way time to time to time so that there's good intra rate of reliability. And we need to make sure that our team as a whole is doing it the same way so there's good inter rate of reliability. So we're gonna start in a, an extended position at the knee and we're gonna start by working on dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So in this case, we're gonna ask the individual to bring their toes to the nose and as they dorsiflex, because they started in a plantar flex position, we know they can obtain a neutral position. So we don't really need to start there with our measurement. We then take our goniometer, our uh, stationary arm is going to be in parallel in line with the fibular shaft. Uh, we're gonna be just a little bit below the lateral malleolus, even though I believe Norkin and White say that the, the lateral to medial malleolus is the axis of rotation. And what that enables us to do is then use our, our uh, mobile arm and parallel it with the lateral aspect of the foot to increase the specificity and accuracy of our range of motion measurement. And so as we take this range of motion measurement, uh, we can bring the goniometer away and we can look at the reading. This individual has about nine degrees of active left ankle dorsiflexion. From that point, we can then ask them to point their toes down. You can use the analogy of pressing the foot on the gas and so they're gonna move then into a plantar flex position. Again, we don't need to uh, start from neutral. We know they already have that due to the resting position. So again, we line our goniometer up. Mobile arm goes in parallel with the lateral aspect of the foot. We draw the goniometer away and the patient can relax. That takes less than 30 seconds. Become proficient with these measurements. And so we look now and the individual has approximately 49 degrees of active ankle plantar flexion, all right? Again, we can look at those passively as well if we wanted to um, uh, provide overpressure or something along those lines, those are options as well. The next measurement that we're gonna look at then is hind foot inversion and eversion. Now with this, sometimes this is a hard motor learning pattern for patients or clients to adopt. And so you may have to actually help them adopt more of a, of a hind foot everted position and 
uh, excuse me, inverted position and an everted position. In either uh, regards, you're gonna wanna provide a, either a, a physical line with a pen or some type of marker or an imaginary line that kind of bisects your distal Achilles tendon because that's where your mobile arm of your goniometer is going to align. Your axis of rotation is going to be your subtalar joint. So if it's, if it's up kind of between your lateral and medial malleolus, you're a little bit too high, that hind foot aversion is occurring uh, between the distal talus and the proximal calcaneus, right? And so our stationary arm is going to bisect our, our distal soleus and through our Achilles tendon. Uh, we're gonna be just distal to the line between lateral and medial malleolus. And then our uh, mobile arm is going to be that line that's bisecting the Achilles tendon and down to the calcaneus. We're gonna ask the individual to bring their foot in. That's going to be hind foot inversion. We can line that up. We take our measurement. In this case, the individual has approximately 11 degrees of hind foot inversion. We then ask them to go into the everted position and we take that measurement again. Now, predictive reasoning would help us here because we know that they're likely to have less eversion than inversion. Typically a two to one ratio or even three to one ratio. And in this case, uh, this individual only has about four degrees of eversion. Right? And so that's right between a two and three to one ratio. We said 11 degrees inversion, four degrees eversion, right? And so he's right at about that three to one ratio. And so that makes sense. That's, a, that's a probably a fairly good, reliable range of motion measurement. The only other measurement that we need to then take in this prone position now is going back to dorsiflexion, but now taking the gastroc uh, out of the equation from a length tension aspect. And so we're gonna bring the individual up to about 90 degrees of knee flexion. We can stabilize just proximal to the medial and lateral malleolus. And again, we can ask the individual to dorsiflex their foot actively. Now, again, predictive reasoning would tell us this should be more than what we saw with the knee extended. And sure enough, when we bring our goniometer into the equation, when we take that measurement, we see exactly that. This individual has right at about 21 degrees of active ankle dorsiflexion with the knee bent. And so we would record both the knee bent uh, range of motion measurement as well as extended. Now, here's where we have to engage in a little bit of clinical reasoning. Why did we see approximately a 10 degree improvement in ankle dorsiflexion from knee extended to knee bent? Well, it's because we took this soft tissue complex out of the equation. And so now if we wanted to actually improve ankle dorsiflexion for our client, we then need to ask, well, where are we going to put our efforts and where are we going to focus our attention? Is this something that is uh, limiting him more at the joint, what we might say arthrokinematically, or is this something that's limiting him more in the periphery soft tissue? Well, since his range of motion went up, when we modified the, the periphery, the soft tissue, that tells us that the joint actually has more than 11 degrees available to it, right? Um, he achieved 21 degrees actively. That's without overpressure or any passive um, uh, manual uh, technique. So if we wanted to kind of capture the low hanging fruit, where we need to focus initially is not so much arthrokinematically with joint mobilizations, but instead focus on soft tissue, soft tissue mobilization, um, perhaps massage or some type of soft tissue uh, a technique there or a manual technique. That will allow us to start to modify or at least impact some of the length tension relationship. Oftentimes there can be some tonality that exists here or some, um, some contraction that's being held uh, more or less by the nervous system. And so if we can modulate that, that can oftentimes lead to an increase in ankle dorsiflexion. From here, we have all the range of motion measurements we need in a prone position. So we're gonna ask our uh, client to move now to the supine position. And there's three range of motion measurements that we want to obtain in this position. The first two are what we would consider to be functional. They don't really uh, go with the hind foot or the forefoot, but it's more kind of uh, regionally specific. So we're gonna have the individual slide down again. So the, the treatment table does not block any range of motion movement. And the movements that we're looking at here are inversion and eversion. And so these are really kind of more forefoot. And so when we ask the individual to move into an inverted position, bringing their toes in, our stationary arm is gonna be right along the anterior aspect of the tibia. We're gonna be right 
distal to the talocrural joint for axis rotation and then in line with the second metatarsal and phalange for our mobile arm. We take that range of motion measurement, which in this case is about 27 degrees of active ankle inversion, and then we look at eversion at the same time. Now, sometimes uh, patients and clients will kind of do this number where they roll the whole extremity out. That's actually occurring up at the hip. That's external rotation. We wanna make sure that they're not uh, utilizing that to gain extra range of motion or that we're missing it and measuring it as more than it is. And so just tactically cueing them, holding them steady and having them evert is a nice way to make sure that you're specific in terms of what you're measuring. All of the positions stay the same. A nice uh, flexible goniometer is nice to have in these cases. You line up with your second metatarsal again and phalange and take the measurement there, go ahead and relax. And in this case, there's about 15 degrees of ankle eversion. So we see about a two to one ratio here. There's a little bit more eversion when we look whole foot and ankle than if we just look at the hind foot like we saw when the individual is in prone. Finally, we wanna look at the great toe. In this position, uh, they are in that resting position or open pack position of the foot and ankle, slight plantar flexion. As we look at the great toe, uh, that can be a hard movement for some patients to isolate. And so we may have to passively kind of move them into that position, have them hold if they have trouble isolating that, that uh, actively. From there, we again use our goniometer. Uh, we're looking at uh, the metatarsal as our stationary arm, met head as our axis of rotation, and then the phalange as our mobile arm. We take our range of motion measurement here, and then we draw that away. And they have just under 90 degrees, about 87 degrees of active uh, great toe extension. Now, functionally, the individual needs at least 45 degrees of great toe extension. Otherwise, they're uh, likely experiencing what we call halicus rigidus, which means that somewhere between the metatarsal, the joint itself, and the phalange, there's something restricting motion. That could be osteophytes, it could be joint destruction due to a degenerative condition like osteoarthritis, um, or, or any number of things. Um, we talked earlier about some alignment, that could also limit that. What that does then is it impacts the windlass mechanism as well as gait efficiency and propulsion. Because as the individual is progressing through the great toe, they're loading that medial longitudinal arch and they're gaining some uh, ability to propel themselves forward during functional activities. If that's restricted, we want to focus our attentions there from a manual intervention standpoint. Um, really the only restriction that can occur here is due to alignment or, or arthrokinematic motions, and so this would be a great place to focus some of that attention. Additionally, we can look at this in a weight-bearing position. We would expect that the range of motion is a little less though at that point because proximally we're going to see a flattening out of that arch. And so what that will do is it'll change some of the length tension relationship with the plantar fascia and some of the other tissues associated with the windlass mechanism. Still though, we wanna see at least 45 degrees of ankle, or excuse me, great toe extension in order for them to be functional and not have an impact on gait. So have a practice with this, make sure you have a small goniometer, preferably one that has some flexibility to it so that you can maneuver in and around the foot and ankle, and let me know if there's any questions.